And so we're going into a series called Who is Jesus? And I, I think there's not a better time or a better place than right now for us to talk about the King of Kings the Lord of Lords. He is the rock of our salvation. He is the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He came to set you free. And I believe that he's gonna do that today for some people. Maybe for the first time, you're gonna experience the grace of God in your life. But this is what I know is true. Whether you've been following Christ for your entire life, or you're walking into this place, or you got tricked into coming to this place this morning, whatever it is, I believe that God is gonna speak to you today. Let's pray. God, we love you. We are so thankful that you left an imprint right here in the middle of humanity, that you sent your son Jesus to take on flesh, be born of a virgin, live a sinless life, and die the death that we deserve. God, we worship you today. And so Lord, as we open your word today, I pray that you would speak to us I pray that you would begin to open eyes that have been shut, that you would open ears that have been shut. God, that you would shut doors that don't need to be open and you would open doors that have been shut. God, that you would move in power and strength. We invite you into this place today. God, we lift up the people in Ukraine right now. Lord, there are people that do not have the ability to gather and worship because they're at war. And so God, we go to war right now on their behalf. Lord, we ask that you would be with them, that you would protect them. God, I pray against the enemy in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, have your way in this world. We need you, God. We need you. I lift up CLC this morning, a church right down the road. I've got friends there. Their lead pastor is on sabbatical right now. And I just pray for Pastor Steve. He's becoming a friend of mine. I pray that you would give him rest, supernatural wisdom and peace as he's alone with his spouse. And they're enjoying just being rejuvenated by you and your spirit, God. We ask that you would move in this today, move in this place today, Lord. And all of God's people said, amen, amen. Turn to the person next to you, say hello, grab a seat and check out this video. Who is Jesus? The high priest. Lion of Judah. The Alpha and Omega. The rock. Victorious one. The mighty one. Our peace. Our hope. Everlasting Father. Cornerstone. The risen Lord. Our Redeemer. The great I am. Who is Jesus? 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 Yeah, would y'all give it up for that video? I didn't make the cut for the video. They said it was only for good looking people. So I just, I'm still mad about that. But uh, who is Jesus? We are diving into a new series today. And I think that that is more exciting than the hogs beating Kentucky yesterday. I don't know about you. I was asking around, I said, you know, is it a good thing in Fayetteville at church after the hogs win? Or do people not show up because they celebrated a little too much the night before? I still don't know. Okay, maybe time will tell today. Uh, ask the person next to you, say, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Uh, today, uh, we're going to begin to unpack this, this question, who is Jesus? I believe from the deepest, deepest parts of my guts that this is a good time to address that question in, in the middle of humanity, in the middle of the brokenness of the world that we live in today. We need Jesus, Amen. And if you're like, I don't need you, you need Jesus, okay? We need Jesus, we need the Savior, we need the Lord, we need peace on earth. We need God now more than ever before. And so I wanna jump straight in. The title of today's message is, I Need the Good Shepherd. Write that down, I Need the Good Shepherd. We're gonna talk through the next several weeks the different things about Jesus. There's no way we could cover all of them, but that's why we have church every Sunday. And so we're gonna keep talking about Jesus. As long as I have a mouth on this planet, I'm gonna speak the name of Jesus. I need the good shepherd. We, we need a good shepherd. We're gonna unpack a psalm today. It's Psalm 23. Uh, some of you may be very familiar with this psalm. Some of you 
uh, may not be, but my goal, and I believe, uh, I was talking with my wife. She's actually at home. She's not feeling well today, so if y'all would pray for her. Um, she was like, babe, I think it would be so cool if our entire church, every family, every kid, every parent, every single person memorized this scripture over the next four weeks. Can we do that? Can I challenge you guys? We're going to have resources that we're going to post on our social media. If you don't follow NLC Fayetteville, go follow them on social media. And uh, we're going to be posting some resources so that you can memorize this. If you've got your kids memorizing scripture, man, record them and send a video. We would love to see that. We're going to read Psalm 23. It'll be on the screens behind me, or you can read it in your Bible. Read it with me. Verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me where I go. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Verse 6 says, surely... Your goodness and your love, some translations, your goodness and your mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell, everybody say dwell. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I want to give a little bit of context because um, when you read scripture, if you're new to reading the Bible, I just want to give you just a little bit of advice. Even if you're old to reading the Bible, it is really good to read the Bible and, and read it with a fresh lens every time you read it. Ask the question, who? Who is writing this text? Who wrote this and who is it being written to? Then, then say, what is the goal of this passage? When was this written? Where was this written? And, and who, was the, who was the audience? And so if you ask these questions, God can begin to reveal himself. This was written by David. And he had a really good understanding of what it was like to be a sheep and be a shepherd because he was both of those. He was a shepherd leading the sheep. And so when he is calling God the shepherd, when he is saying that Jesus is the good shepherd, he is acknowledging that he is a what? A sheep. And I don't know for you, but I can tell you for me, um, out of all the animals in, in the world that God could have com compared humans to, he had a lot of choices. Would y'all agree? Like, uh, there's a lot of choices. He could have went through so many choices, like a cobra. Okay, like, that's cool. Like a cobra, vicious, right? They look kind of cool. You, I, we could have been pit bulls, okay? Like, ferocious, willing to bite somebody, okay? A lion, a tiger, a bear, for crying out loud, okay? You could have been little cubs, and he could have been Papa Bear, okay? Like, it could, I could go so many ways with this, but what did he choose? He looked at humanity, and he said, they will be sheep. Everybody say, bye. <laughs> That's just like, I'm, I read it, and I'm like, this is crazy. Like, we're, we're sheep, and I came to encourage you today because there's hardly any good qualities about sheep, <laughs> There is. I'm going to read through some things. Let's start with intelligence, okay? There is really not much there, okay? And I'm not trying to insult you today. Just have some fun with me. You don't see sheep in the circus doing any tricks. They just don't, okay? Like, they're not smart. They have no sense of direction. They wander off all the time and get lost. Some of y'all are like, I am so offended. Get over it, okay? They, they hurt themselves. They don't even have enough sense. A sheep, I was studying sheep. They don't even have enough sense that when all the grass is gone, where they're eating, you know when it says that he leads them into green pastures? It's because if they stayed there in that pasture, they will stop eating the grass when it's gone, and they'll start eating the feces of the other sheep. Some of y'all are like, that's really messed up. You're a sheep? Okay, like, we're sheep. And what about defense mechanisms? They can't run. They can't jump. And they can't bend their knees. That sounds like me in high school or middle school, okay? Like, no one has ever had a sign in their yard that says, beware of the sheep. Like, it's just, the sheep, they really don't have a lot of things going. What about nerves? They're skittish. They get scared easily. Thunder, lightning, loud noises. Even wind can scare a sheep. Sheep can't clean themselves. Some of y'all are like, okay, Seth, we get it. We're useless, right? Like, sheep can't clean themselves. Insects. A beetle can clean itself. An ant can clean itself. 
Dogs can clean themselves, even dry themselves off. Cats can clean themselves. It looks demonic, but they can do it. Okay, like, but sheep, oh no, they can't. Sheep will die covered in filth if they didn't have a good shepherd to, to clean them. If a sheep rolls on its back, it will lay in that position, and if it is not nudged, it will die in the same position that it lays in. Can't get off of its back. Are you encouraged this morning? Okay, like, so all of this is going in a direction. A sheep without a shepherd, ultimately what you need to know this morning is in big trouble. And I can relate in my life because I was a sheep and I didn't know that I had a good shepherd. And how many of you want to know I was in big trouble? I think we can all go back to a time in our life. We, we are sheep and we need a shepherd, but not just a shepherd. We need the good shepherd. We need the good shepherd. And in this series, we're going to unpack who is Jesus. And the first thing that we have to know before we go any further is that we need the good shepherd. I've got a few thoughts, not all of the thoughts. I don't have time for all of them. But what does a good shepherd do? Number one, if you're taking notes, write this down. He cares for you. He cares for you. Turn to the person next to you and say, he even cares for you, okay? I know you may be shocked, but he cares for you. Verse 1 of Psalm 23 says, the Lord is my shepherd. There's some ownership here. I, I lack nothing. Now, some people will read the end of this verse, I lack nothing, and they will go super prosperity, and, and God's going to give me all of these things. Some people read this, and they go super poverty. And they think that I'm going to have nothing. I, I go in between those two things, and I think that my God is a God of provision, and he knows exactly what we need. And so you may be here this morning and have a need. I believe God knows exactly what that need is. He, he's a good shepherd. But here's what you got to know is that a good shepherd doesn't give you necessarily what you want. He gives you what you need. There is a difference, by the way. Did anybody have something that you believed for and you wished for and you prayed for and praise God that he didn't give you the thing that you thought you needed? Okay, some of y'all are like, I'm sitting next to him right now. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm joking. But there's so many times in my life I'm thankful. It's like that old country song, you know, thank God for unanswered prayers. Like I, I'm just thankful. Matthew 6 says this in verse 25, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink. Or about your body or what you will wear, isn't life more than food and isn't the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they are? Because he cares for you, he provides for you. If you're a parent in here, you, you provide for your children, why? Because you care for them. Verse 2 in, in Psalm 23, it goes on to say, He makes me lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside quiet waters. I, I read this, and I get really excited because I'm thankful we have a God that makes us slow down. Anybody thankful for that? We, we move really fast through life. But like I said, ask questions when you read through Scripture. So the question that came up for me is, why Green pastures. Write that down. Circle it. Why green pastures? In this context, the green pastures actually represent contentment. This is a cuss word for most people, okay? Uh, contentment. And, and true contentment is only found in Christ. It's not, it's not found in more of this or more of that or another person. It is found in the person of Christ. And it's very difficult to lay down and rest if you are not content, your mind's racing, you got a lot of things going on. Everybody say contentment. Complacency is the enemy of contentment. It is the thief of contentment. When you are complacent, it is very difficult to be confident and content with what God has you doing, where God has you at, and who God has called you to be. Maybe you've been there. Maybe you're there this morning and you are so ready for the next thing. But here's the thing. When you get to the next thing, you will be ready for what? The next thing. And then some of us will get to the next thing that we begged God for. And then we will pray that he will take us out of that season. Contentment. 
This, this green pasture, it's a representation of contentment. If the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. If the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. I'm going to say it again just in case you missed it. If the Lord is my shepherd, y'all say it with me, I lack nothing. If I have Jesus, I have all that I need. It's important to know that in Israel, green pastures look different than what we would think they look like. It's not this big luscious field of greenery and all-you-can-eat buffet for billy goats and sheep. Like, that's not what it is. It's, it's actually a very dry place. A rain is very rare, 22 inches, you know, maybe per year. And here's the thing is it took a good shepherd to locate the next place to take the sheep. And so when they were eating the grass, most likely they would eat all of the grass in an area and the shepherd would have to relocate them to somewhere else. He would care for his sheep by guiding them and directing them because he cared for them. But it was very normal to come across, if you were navigating, a dry place, a desert, if you will, a field full of dirt. And I just want to speak to the person who's here this morning who's in a dry season, and you feel like there is no life around you. Can I tell you, everybody look at me, there is life in you yet. You may be in a dry season, but God can breathe life into you this morning and change the direction forever in your life. It is completely normal to be in a dry season as a believer, but can I encourage you, please don't decide to stay there. Don't set up a tent and camp in that place and become a victim of your own circumstance. Can you invite God into the present moment and say, God, I trust you because if you are my shepherd, I lack nothing. I want you to guide me and to, to lead me, to lie down and rest in the goodness of Jesus, to get refreshed and renewed, rejuvenated and restored. He's a river of life, and he will give you exactly what you need. Maybe not what you think you need, but exactly what you need. It requires the sheep to stay close to him. Write that down. You got to stay close to the good shepherd because he knows what you need. He's going to lead you to the place that you need it. And then the next day he's going to give you what you need. And the next day he's going to give you what you need. There's going to be days that you have less. There's going to be days that you have more than you need. But I know this with following Jesus. There's never been a day that I have gone without. Because my good shepherd, he provides for me. I just have to stay close to him. If I have Jesus, I have all I need. So naturally, my next question that I ask when I'm reading this text is, okay, why green pastures? My next one is, well, why quiet waters? Write that down. Why quiet waters? The verse says that he leads me beside quiet waters. The water in this passage, it represents peace. Everybody say peace. Would you all agree the world needs some of this? That the world probably needs to be led to some quiet water and some peace for our soul. Not all water is peaceful, though. Would y'all agree? <laughs> Bath time at 7 o'clock in the Tom Boley household is not peaceful. Okay, my, my son, he will get water. We've got drywall coming off of the walls because of him splashing. Okay, we got to fix that in Jesus' name, all right? The Buffalo River is not peaceful. The Spring River, have you ever been in that thing? Hardy, Arkansas, it will freeze you to death. It is not peaceful. The, the wave pool growing up that I used to go to at Wild River Country, that is the furthest thing from peace, okay? Like, it was complete chaos. Fend for yourself, okay? Try not to drown. But here's the thing is this water, it, it represents peace. Why? Because it is a quiet, still water. What do we know about quiet and still water? It, it's refreshing. It, it renews you. It's full of life. It replenishes you. But at the time, keep in mind, when was this written? Go back in time. A, a quiet body of water was the only place that David could go to see his reflection. It was the only place. There was no selfie cameras, okay? There was no selfie sticks. There, there was no mirrors to look into. And so if you wanted to reflect on the goodness of God and the brokenness of humanity, if you wanted to reflect on your life and who God has created you to be, you look into the still waters and you would see your reflection. You would see who God created. You, I believe that when we reflect, God begins to speak. 
Listen, when water is moving and flowing and running and rushing and moving fast and fast and fast, you cannot see what's beneath the surface of that water. God began to speak to me about this because, listen, when the water is still, you can see everything. Any people who like to fish in here? we got some fishermen, okay? You could, you could see beneath the surface when the water is still and it's kind of shallow. You could see the smallest bug that lands on the water, a little minnow swimming through, a little crawdad, okay? <laughs> you could see the smallest or the biggest ripple. Why? Because it's still, it's calm, and it's quiet. You would be very shocked in your life about what God can do in your life if you would get still, calm, and quiet. You want a recipe for some peace in your life? Get still, calm, and quiet. What does the good shepherd do? He leads me to green pastures and quiet water so that I could find rest for my soul. So I can look at my reflection and say, God, what do you want to change about my life? Where have I wandered off? Bring me back to the goodness of God. I believe God today wants his people to get still, calm, and quiet. Because that's when you can see beneath the surface in your life. That, that's when you can see your reflection and his reflection. That's when you can see that the Holy Spirit does have a plan for your life. Did you know that you have a choice whether you're going to step into that thing or not? I want to encourage you to step into it. And I believe there will be peace, tangible peace in your life. Can, can we do ourselves a favor today and just slow down? Everybody take a big, deep breath. Breathe out. We spoke a message on the Sabbath several weeks ago. Go back and listen to that. Take a real rest and walk with him. For his yoke is easy and his burden is what? Light. It is not heavy. If you're heavy this morning, walk with Jesus. He's the good shepherd. So Jesus takes us to the place where the water is pure, it's clear, and it's almost motionless. And we can reflect and find ourselves in Christ. And his invitation goes all the way back to Isaiah 55, and it says this, everyone, that means everyone, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. He says in Revelation 7, 17 at the end, he says, for the Lamb of God will shepherd them and he will lead them to the living fountains of water. I believe that God's already this morning starting to refresh some people, that you're realizing I don't have to carry this heavy load. God never called me to carry it. And he definitely didn't call me to carry it alone. And everybody said, amen. There's peace in this place. You have access. Number two, because he cares for you, he corrects you and he directs you. Now, some people just got really tense, okay? Correction. I don't want no correction, you know? Like, <laughs> I don't want correction, y'all. These were almost two separate thoughts, two separate points. But then I thought about myself growing up, okay? My aunt and uncle are here right now. They saw, they had a front row seat to it growing up, right? I was a bad kid. I was disobedient. Where am I disobedient? If you were disobedient as a kid, don't lie in church. Raise your hand, okay? Y'all, my brothers and sisters. I always found a way to break the rules, break the laws. I was going to find a way around. Some people say it's stupid. I say street smarts, okay? <laughs> they go hand in hand because without correction, it's really hard to receive God's direction for your life. Here's the thing. Don't miss this. If you stiff arm God's correction, you will have no direction. It's not just cute because it rhymes, it's the truth. <laughs> you can't have one or the other, you have to have both. I want him to correct me and, and direct me. Have y'all ever been around somebody who hates correction? Some of you are like, my kids, okay? <laughs> like, uh, maybe they thought that they, they're always right, they can do no wrong. They would rather be right than do right. This was me growing up, it says in this passage, that he refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you're with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Proverbs 12, 1, it says this, I love the Bible. Sometimes it makes me laugh. This is what it says, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but whoever hates correction is stupid, okay? Turn to the person next to you and say, don't be stupid, okay? Correction's a good thing. I, I believe this, that we need to crave correction. We need to seek out to be corrected. I was, like I said, I was a mischievous kid growing up, and actually um, this, this week I was talking to my mom, and I call my mom almost every day. I FaceTime her, and I just say, Mom, how's your day going? Talk to her, you know, get off the phone. Well, well this past week I 
it was her birthday, and I FaceTime and I was like, hey, there's no really big reason I'm calling. I just wanted to check on you. And she's like looking at me kind of funny, you know, on FaceTime. I was like, why are you acting weird? And she's just looking at me. Well, I was like, all right, well, I'll let you go. And I got off the phone, didn't tell her happy birthday. Idiot, okay. <laughs> and, and Kendra calls me, my wife. She said, did you tell your mom happy birthday today? And I was like, oh, that's why she was looking like that, you know. And so I call her back, and she's just laughing. But my mom reminded me of this story when I was in fifth grade. Fifth grade, already bad. Nobody taught me how to sin. I just knew, okay, professional. And I was in fifth grade. We had this, Arkansas started this thing. Some of you will know what this is, the accelerated reading program. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Yeah, okay. The AR reading program, but I bet you didn't know this, what I'm about to tell you. I'm about to educate some people, okay. I learned, I learned that, (laughs) it's so bad. (laughs) <laughs> if you go to the library, what would happen is you would read a book. It took all my friends three, three days three or three weeks to get done with this book. You would take a quiz on the book. Based off of your score on the, the quiz, you got AR cash, all right? We got cash, not real cash. I wasn't, like, making it rain, but it was like this. You could buy things at this little store, snacks and all kinds of games. And so I'm trying to figure out how can I get more cash without doing more work, you know? <laughs> and so I start, I come up with this plan. I started getting the biggest books in the library because I learned if the book has more than 400 pages in it, ain't nobody made a quiz about that book. Why? Because nobody wants to read that book. So I got dictionaries. (laughs) I got encyclopedias. I got instruction manuals for building things that I don't even know what they are. And this is what happened. I was scanning them, and it would give me automatic points. (laughs) It was amazing. I had all kinds of points. I was at the lunch table making it rain. I was buying people snacks, Skittles, Starburst, chicken nuggets. Like I, I was, that's, I, it was just who I was. Built, made some new friends. But one day I got called to the office <laughs> and the principal, the librarian, mean lady, and my mother was sitting there. My mom was reminding me about this. And there next to the desk was a stack of books that was huge. I've never seen these books besides when I scanned them, okay? <laughs> And they were like, did you read all these books? And I'm like, do you think I read those books? You know, I'm in fifth grade, right? I accelerated that reading program at our elementary school, okay? Like, <laughs> they shut the whole thing down. Street smart, baby, okay? <laughs> I-, I need correction. Turn to the person next and say, you need correction. We need it. We got to crave it. Because we will not change direction unless we receive what? Correction. I'm going to get a little bit passionate about this because we live in a world that wants to take the scripture and do whatever it wants with it. Can I get a little bit bold? We live in a world today that wants to take pieces of the Bible and say, I want it to obey me, not me obey it. No, the word of God is God breathed. It was God inspired. It says that the word became flesh and lived amongst you. So you're telling me if the Bible had flaws, then Jesus had flaws? I don't think so. So the word, it corrects me and it, and it directs me. Did y'all know that sheep are undrivable? Like you can't force them in a direction from behind. You have to get out in front of them and lead them. And this is what they're listening for. They're listening for a, a voice. They're listening to a familiar sound. I was reading this article about there was 15,000 sheep in a valley. All of these shepherds were around, and they each made their noise. I don't know what the noise were. It was probably like a, ah, you know, like a, bah. I don't know, okay? But they would make the noise, and their flock would follow them. Hundred at a time, thousand at a time. And y'all want to know that there was not one sheep left in that valley? Why? Because they know the voice of their shepherd. Do you know the voice of your shepherd this morning? I've learned that it takes me to get still and calm and quiet to be able to hear his voice. Maybe this morning God wants you to get calm and quiet in his presence so that he can speak to you, so that he can show you. He wants to lead you into green pastures. He wants to lead you beside quiet water so that you can see your reflection and you can meditate on who God has created you to be. It says in scripture that Jesus says, my sheep know my voice. If he guides us along the right paths, keep in mind, street smart. If there's right paths, that means that there's what? Wrong paths, right? That's pretty intelligent. (laughs) If there's right paths, then there's wrong paths. It says in Isaiah 53, verse 6, all of us like sheep have strayed away. We've all left God's path and followed our own way. That's one of the best ways to describe the human condition right now. 
We think we have a better way. We think that we know best. We think that we, no, listen to me. We need a good shepherd because we are sheep. And we need to know the voice. I, I want to preach a little bit because I, I don't know about you, but I know all about the wrong paths. Anybody, can, you, can I get a little witness this morning, right? I know about the wrong paths. When I was in college, I majored in wrong paths and dead ends. And let me tell you that every single one of them came up short. None of them truly satisfied my soul. I was always left empty. I always needed more. I always needed more of this and more a bigger high. I always Listen to me. When you have a relationship with Jesus, if you lose everything in the world, that is all that you need. Your world may feel like it's crashing around you, like your foundation is crumbling. If you're standing on the rock of salvation, Jesus Christ, can I tell you the world doesn't stand a chance? He's already fought the fight. He's not leading from behind. He came and he led the way from the front. And it says he laid down his life for the sheep. He died for you and, and me. Reckless living and sin. My, my years of longing for the approval of other people. My pride. I had anger problems. The, the lust that I struggled with all of my childhood. The bitterness towards my father. The unforgiveness the false idols that I had built in our life, false idols are not an Old Testament thing, just so you know. Some of us spend our entire lives scrolling through a false idol, looking for identity. Your identity will not come from that phone. It's gonna come from your Father in heaven. He spoke exactly what he created you to be. Would you be bold today and just step into it? I lived in sin for a long time, and like I said a couple of weeks ago, I, it's gonna be really hard to shut me up talking about Jesus. And I have zero apologies. I learned a really valuable lesson in college that when you love sin, please don't miss this. When you love sin more than you love Jesus, correction is always needed, but it is rarely wanted. I'm gonna say it again. When you love sin more than you love Jesus, correction is always needed, but it is rarely wanted. But I learned that if you fully submit yourself to Jesus, if you submit your life to God, correction is always wanted and desired, but it's rarely needed. Let me explain. Because when you're fully submitted to Jesus, he guides you on the right paths. This word, it says that even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Correction leads to direction, ultimately so that my God can bring me protection. I can't get the protection of God. I can't be under the covering of God unless I'm obedient to his voice. Unless I'm obedient to when he corrects me and redirects me so that I can be under the covering of the Lord, the Most High. He wants to lead us by, by green pastures and still waters and he wants to speak to us. I don't know about you, but I find comfort in correction. It may not be comfortable in the moment, but it's comfortable on the back end, baby. It may not be comfortable when you're a kid and you're getting corrected and maybe you got a little bit of whoopings growing up. Hey, but on the back end, I'm thankful for the correction because it made me the man that I am today. I wrote down this quote. This is one that you probably need to remember. Correction is only seen as judgment to those who still love their sin more than they love their shepherd. I'm gonna say it again. Correction is only seen as judgment to those who love their sin more than they love their good shepherd. The third thing is he protects you. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Did y'all know that if there's a real God, there's a real devil? This is basic just understanding theology. If there is a real God, there is a real devil. If there is a real heaven, there is a real what? Some of y'all just cussed the church, okay? Like, there is, and we understand that eternity is, is it's way bigger than we could ever grasp or imagine. And so when we look at God's word, I wonder sometimes if, if, if we're in the room today and, and we're begging for God to calm the storm in our life, what if he just wants to calm his child who's in the storm? What if he's not going to take away the storm that's around you? What if he's just going to speak and calm you who's in the middle of the storm? What if that very storm was actually there to, to make you into the person that God wants you to be? All of those bad things that happened to me, God used to advance what? The gospel. 
So don't wish away the storm. Ask God to guide you in the storm. I love 2 Timothy 3.16. It says all scripture is God breathed. It's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Becoming more like Christ so that the servant of God, that's us, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. When I got saved, can I be honest with you all this morning in church? Is that all right? When I got saved, I did not like the Bible. Why did I not like the Bible when I got saved? Because it required me to change things that I liked. Why did I struggle with embracing the entire word of God? Because it required me to step out of who I was and into who God was calling me to be. I had a hard time being corrected. I had a hard time being redirected, and I loved the idea of a Savior who died for me, but I did not like the idea of a Lord who wants to lead me. We, we see a whole world of people that struggle with this. Why? Because I am a sinner, and I need correction every single day. God's people said amen. Like, we need, we need correction. We, meet, we need to be directed. The Word of God, it requires me to change. It requires me to turn from my sin, not embrace my sin, not become my sin, not follow my sin, not become best friends with my sin. It requires me to lay my sin down and pick up Jesus every single day. Pick up my cross and follow him. Maybe you're here and you've pitched a tent in the middle of your sin. Can today be the day you take that tent down and you say, I'm crossing over into a better place that God wants me to go? I'm tired of eating the dirt of the ground. God wants to take me into a green pasture. Y'all heard what sheep do? They get so distracted, they start eating poop. That is the best way to describe humanity in the middle of sin. So maybe you're in this place and you have been running from God and you, you are far from God and you're saying, Seth, there's no way God could love someone like me. The last point is just for you. He, he cares for you. He, he directs you, he corrects you, he protects you. And the last thing is this, is that he pursues you. Why does he pursue us? Because he knew that we would run. <laughs> Anybody ran from God before? Raise your hand, you could be honest, right? How did that work out? For me, it wasn't good. He, he pursues us. It says in his, in his word that if a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills to go after the one who wandered off? And when he finds it, truly, I tell you that he is happier about that one sheep than the 99 that wandered off. Would you stand to your feet across the room? This is good news. This is great news that we have a good shepherd. Who is Jesus? He's my good shepherd. Can you say that? He's my good shepherd. That's who he is. He wants to guide you and lead you. There's moments of correction, but that leads to direction. Ultimately, so our God can protect you. And even when we get it wrong, what does he do? He pursues us. The last part of that verse is Psalm 23, 6. It says, surely your goodness and love will follow me all of the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. I will dwell in the house of the Lord. There's two types of pursuit in the Bible. Just so you know, one of them is from the enemy, and one of them is from the Lord. 1 Peter 5.8 talks about the enemy's pursuit. He says, be alert and of sober mind because your enemy, there's a real enemy, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. God's pursuit is way different. This is what God's pursuit is. Surely your goodness and your love will follow me all the days of my life. Would you close your eyes across the room? And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This, this passage, you can take the word follow, and this is what it means. It means that it is chasing after you. The love of God has been chasing you. The mercy of God has been chasing you. It's been pursuing you. And this is what I love about our Father in heaven is he never stops chasing his children. So much to the point that he sent his only son, the good shepherd, to take our place. So if you're in this room with no one looking around and you are saying, Seth, I need a good shepherd. Maybe you've wandered off. Maybe you have never put faith in Jesus. Would you do me a favor? No one looking around. Would you just slip your hand up so I know who I'm praying with? You've wandered off. You want to come back this morning. I see you up top. I see you up front. You're not alone. I see you right here up front. I see you. 
I see you off to the left. Praise God. You want to come back to the Father? This is what it says. It says that you turn from your sin, you acknowledge that you're a sinner, and you say, Jesus, I put my trust and my faith in you. You receive him as your Lord and Savior, and you inherit eternal life. I, I would love to be able to pray with you after service today, lead you in that. There's nothing special about my prayer, but I don't want you to walk out of this place without getting prayer from someone. Maybe you're in this place this morning and you have been following God and you just needed to be brought back to green pastures and still water this morning to, to quiet your soul, to cause you to calm down, to, to push out the worries of this world. This morning, if that's you, would you just speak the name of Jesus? Just say, Jesus, he's a good shepherd. He wants to give you rest this morning and peace this morning. I'm so thankful for the love of our God. Who is Jesus? He's the good shepherd. And this morning we receive his love. In Jesus' name, everybody said.